Hello everyone, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement, and we're here with Aaron Glover. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and your role, please? Uh, but before we do that, we'll just acknowledge the lands that we're on because we're on separate lands. Acknowledge the traditional owners, past, present and emerging. Take it away. Yeah, great. So um, I'm Aaron Glover. I, I um, work for the Lutheran Church in Queensland and serve as the director of uh, Lutheran Youth of Queensland. So Lutheran Youth of Queensland is the um, uh, our church's state child youth and family ministry department. Um, and we exist to support churches and schools in, in their ministry with, with young people. Um, and we offer, I guess, centrally some activities. So normally camps and training events that try to um, supplement and support what's happening at the local level. Um, so I've been in this role I got a reminder on Facebook, I think yesterday. Um, so I've been in this role since the 1st of December, 2007. So um, that makes 14 years, I think, which is a fair stretch. Um, uh, in my home life, I'm married and have four children, um, ranging from, oh, they've just graduated, but uh, grade, grade one through to grade seven. Excellent. So I'll ask you the classic question, why are young people not as attracted to church as say they once were? And of course, you know, there's exceptions to the rule. There are some churches that have quite thriving youth groups and overseas, mm. different story, but sort of what, what's your opinion on why it doesn't appeal to young people as much as it once did? Yeah, it's a, look, it's a, it's a great question. And I don't know if there is a, a single answer. I think, um, I think young people are actually not that different to everyone else. So I think young people are looking for community. Um, I think they are looking for uh, answers to the bigger questions of life um, that, that faith provides. Um, and I, I think they're looking for something that's authentic and real. I, I think where the disconnect happens is that our services, our communities don't necessarily speak into their lived experience, um, don't necessarily um, uh, preach uh, on and, and talk about the things that they want to talk about or need to talk about as they, um, as they seek to, to understand who God is and what that means for, their, for them and for their life. Um, and, you know, they might not actually like some of our worship, you know, the way that, that um, that works for other members of our church community might not work for them. So that some of it's um, some of it might be style, but I think ultimately, I actually reckon that young people will stay in a church and join a church if they feel welcomed. Um, and I guess the question is, how are we making young people a welcomed part of our community? Um, do they feel loved? Do they feel like the community knows who they are? Um, at not just a surface level, you know, knows more than just their name? Um, and do they care about uh, what's happening in their life situation? Um, and I think like every member of our church, if we are doing that for young people, then I think they're interested. Um, if they feel like it's just tokenist, um, uh, you know, we, maybe we know who they, what their name is or we say hello when they walk in the door. Um, but actually there's no meaningful engagement, then I, yeah, I don't think they last very long. In the uh, Anglican church, they, had a, they were really big on the generations together, this idea that, well, they don't really, young people don't want the youth groups, they want to be with other people of all ages. And then other people are saying, well, actually, they do want to be with people their own age who can relate better. What's your sort of opinion on the, the idea of generations together? Uh, look, I... I'm a big advocate for, for generations together, um, particularly, um, particularly as a, in regards to worship. I think um, I think the research is actually pretty clear in that space. So, um, you know, in the course of the 14 years that I've worked for LYQ, there's been lots of research that's come out from the states. A lot of it's been around for, for decades too, but it, and even the newer stuff from from Fuller, um, it all. It all has similar themes to it. And um, typically in terms of passing on the faith, um, 
the family is pretty key in that space. And so worshipping as a family is actually a, a really um, a key way of passing on faith. So I, I think intergenerational is important. And I think for young adults or, um, you know, older young, young people, um, I think they do value relationships with older people. Um, you know, I, I look at the way my kids connect with their grandparents um, and there is, there's a connection there that um, is, is really special and beautiful. Um, I see how they connect with older members of our church and, um, and that would be the same. Like, so I, I think that's important. But I actually think young people do, they, they do need a peer community. So I, I'm kind of both and. Um, I, think, um, I think if you're a small church in a rural setting, um, then I think you can, you can provide both by providing that intergenerational experience in the church setting um, and maybe, you know, sending that young person away to a camp or a, an event where they will meet other young people so that they can, they can see that they're not this strange young person that has a faith, um, but that actually there is a, there's a real movement of young people that they're a part of. Um, so, yeah, I think both are valid and important. And how do you find, when it comes to the focus on young people, so there's a lot, like especially again with the Anglican Church, a lot of focus on oh, how do we get young people to come to church? Mm. How do the older people um, take that? Because uh, I was in a church once where they were kind of like joking, oh, okay, no one cares about us. It's always, how do we get young people? We're losing young people. And we sort of take for granted that the older people that are already there. And I remember going to a Generations Together service uh, in an, another denomination and noticed that when the kids section came up, when kids were sort of front and center it some people were rolling their eyes looking at their phone so they weren't really engaging with that generations together so how do older people find the emphasis on young people do you ever see a tension with that or uh, what about us uh, yeah look uh, yes would be the short answer um and i i actually think it is on us as older people and i, I guess i more and more class myself in that space um but um the reality is that if you're a member of a church and you are older than, you know, 25 years old, it is likely that you are going to be there for a long time. You know, faith has, um, has worked its way into who you are and will carry you likely into eternity. Um, I 100% believe that our priority has to be to focus on young people. Um, so... I think we should, as the older parts of the church, and um, be making sacrifices so that the young people feel welcomed and a part of our community. Because they're the passing on fa of faith to those young people is not assured. Um, and anything that we can do, even if it means I feel uncomfortable in church, I don't get to sing the songs that I sing. You know, as a as a parent, if it means that my kids. Uh, are growing in faith and feel connected in the community, I will sacrifice all those things. Um, and every old person in our church um, has either kids or grandchildren or they have nieces or nephews um, and they, they do need to mentally switch on and go, actually, I would give up these things for those young people in my life to know Jesus. Um, and so there, there is a cost. Um, one of my laments at church at the moment is that we don't have enough crying babies in our church. Um, and I, I miss that. I, uh, I miss the uncomfortableness of what that brings. Um, and I know that in, in the long run that our church is poorer for not having that, that chaos in the morning um, that a crying baby or young people bring. Um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, and with your sort of part of the world, with the Lutheran Church and young people, when it comes to, and I'll use the phrase social justice, but of course, you know, some people are in other, other, other terms, but what are some of the things that uh, young people in the Lutheran Church are sort of involved in? You know, look, at, I, I think young people generally are, are interested in, in um, how their faith intersects with the real world. So, um, so they are interested in, in environmental issues. They are interested in how we're caring for the poor um, and for those that are, that are the vulnerable in our community. Um, so I think they are, they are real things. 
Um, we probably don't have denominational wide movements. Um, like most established churches, we have um, aid agencies and um, that work mainly overseas, uh, providing um, real practical care to, to people. And young people do connect with those, those parts of our church. Um, and then a lot of our churches will have local initiatives too, whether that's um, food baskets or um, care packages that they give. So those, those things do exist in our church, but I, I don't see, at least in our Lutheran context, um, uh, an increase in movement. Like I, I, think, I think there is a, uh, a focus in that space that, that has felt a bit consistent probably for the last decade or so, yeah. With the, you mentioned sort of the like the aid agencies. Mm. I chatted to someone once in the Salvation Army who said that one of the negatives of kind of professionalising uh, the charity arm of the Salvation Army is that the people that went to church kind of, they got more and more distant from that arm of, of the church. Do you kind of share that opinion or do you think, oh, no, you need to have these kind of separate groups doing good work and then young people can kind of engage in it by joining yeah. those groups? Yeah, look, I, I don't know. I, um, I have to admit that I, I've lived, you know, even in my experience of church, it, it's, it's just always been that way. So I, I don't know if I know a different experience to, to, to compare it. Um, but I, I think there is always, as our, because look at the mainline current um, denominations. You've got um, schools and hospitals and, uh, a whole stack of different services that have grown up over the years. And I, I do think one of the challenges of those mainline churches is to um, somehow connect the local person in the pew, uh, whether that be young or old, to what is happening in those services um, and the care um, and the chaplaincy and the, and the provision that's actually being provided. I, um, I think it's easy for there to be a disconnect. So I, I can I can understand where your where your friend has come from. Yeah. And just to ask you about something, another aspect of your work with the ecumenical work, because I know you've had some involvement with the ecumenical work. Churches tend to, and again, you know, there are exceptions, tend to be quite um, narrow, as in, you know, you go to a Catholic church, an Anglican church, etc. Um, can you tell us about sort of your ecumenical work and the, the value of sort of learning from others? Yeah, look. So I've, over the last 14 years, I've been involved in different capacities. So I've, um, I'm part of a children's ministry network, an ecumenical group that meets um, regularly to talk about um, uh, ministry initiatives for in Queensland um, uh, to support ministry with children. Um, I've been a part of ecumenical tertiary chaplaincy. Um, so a group that uh, helped to manage um, tertiary chaplains at, at a couple of campuses in Brisbane. And um, there's been a bit of an ad hoc uh, kind of youth ministry network um, that's met from time to time over the 14 years. It's kind of ebbed and flowed based on whether there's been enough interest across the denominations. Um, and then obviously I was involved with you in, in a particular uh, uh, ecumenical event uh, where we brought uh, a group of young adults together to um, uh, underneath the Queensland heads of churches um, to kind of talk to them about what ecumenism might mean for them and for their generation, whether it still had any relevance. Um, and look, I, I've found great value over the years of connecting ecumenically, um, both uh, professionally in terms of learning from what um, other parts of our church are doing and parts of the kingdom are doing. Um, and I particularly enjoyed that, that um, retreat that we held, uh, ecumenical retreat that we held with you. And um, I forget exactly, I think there was 14 other young adults, um, thereabouts. Uh, that was um, that was very special. Actually, what I particularly enjoyed was the, the prep work that I got to do with a, a colleague from the Uniting Church and a colleague from the Catholic Church. And uh, just as we kind of prepared for that experience, uh, to facilitate that experience for you and um, and then lived it and debriefed it. Um, yeah, I, re I really treasured the opportunity to learn more about those faith traditions, um, what they held dear, um, and then to consider what that might mean for me in, in my um, lived experience of faith. So, yeah, I, I found it 
ecumenical engagement, both uplifting personally um, and then, yeah, organisationally, just been wonderful to be able to, to leverage um, and get the advantage of, of wider wisdom um, and experience. So, yeah, it's been a real blessing. Yeah, but it was a great experience. I'm very grateful that I got to be part of that. So yeah. thank you for the invitation. Can I ask you about youth group itself? Like, what is the purpose of a youth group? The reason I ask that is because I've been to some youth groups where there's mostly social activities and then some religion. And some people say that's great, that's what they want. Others are saying, well, why am I sending my kid to a, a social event at a church? It's supposed to be, you know, a sp more spiritual experience. What's your kind of view on what a youth group should be doing? Yeah, look, I, I, I think it's imperative that a youth group is purposeful, um, has, a, has a clear understanding of why they exist and what they're trying to achieve. I think just, just as any ministry part of, of our church should, right? So, um, and absolutely within that strategy might include um, social activities. So I've, I've lived that, I guess, in, in running youth groups, um, I'm living it now as a parent of a child at a youth group. Um, and I, so for me, youth group is, um, is actually a very, very special opportunity for young people to, to gather with their peers. And I think that's a valuable experience uh, and to be mentored by, by others who are slightly older or, or you know, they may be even as old as us. Um, and I, I think that's valuable to, as a, as a parent, I appreciate um, additional wise adult voices speaking into the life of my child. Um, so I think that's that's really valid. I, I do think that youth group um, needs to be who we are. You know, so our church has a reason for being. We have a, we have a truth uh, in the gospel of Jesus that we need to share. And I think if your youth group is not doing that, then you're selling, um, you're selling the young people short. There are lots of entertainment opportunities outside in the world, um, particularly the older the child gets. Um, and I think we do need to be intentional about sharing um, that truth about Jesus to young people. Um, but I, look, I look at my what my son's experience has been. You know, this is his first year of going to youth group this year. And, um, the social nights have been great for, to allow him to bring his friends along. Um, and so that's been, I think, wonderful to, to build those relationships and connections within that, that faith community. Um, but he's actually really enjoyed the, the faith nights, um, even though typically less people will come to those, um, because I think he's been able to share um, and grow and, and hear from others. So I think both, can, uh, both are important. Um, if I had to focus on one, I would focus on this on the on a study and um, a deliberate faith focus, knowing that young people can create their own social activities outside of of church. Um, so yeah, I look, yeah. If if you're strategic, and I think if you were starting from new, I would, you know, I would start with a small group of young people, and I would run a small group and just disciple them. Uh, and build and effectively equip them to, to be um, the youth leaders for their peers when they go to a, a party, or they go bowling with their mates or whatever they do. Um, equip them in that small group to be able to share, uh, share who Jesus is to their friends. Um, and I would build the youth group that way rather than going for an event style approach up front that brought in a big crowd that maybe didn't um, grow any deeper. So, you know, I, the, the gospel needs to be central, I think, to, to be successful. And I've heard from uh, conservative churches who will often say, you know, oh, we get criticised by the more progressive uh, churches, but our youth groups tend to be bigger. We have more people coming to our church. Is, has that been your experience? And are there sort of lessons we can take from the more conservative churches? Do they do, they do youth group differently? You know, Dave, you might need to define for me what the conservative churches are. Uh, what the, like, give, me, give me a bit more context. Yeah, so the, some of the churches that are a lot more traditional will, will sometimes say, oh, we get um, picked on by more progressive, more liberal 
um, mm -hmm. churches, uh, but they turn around and say their response is that, but our churches have bigger youth groups generally than your more progressive, more liberal ones. So there is clearly mm -hmm. a support out there for our traditional uh, way of doing things. And I just wondered if that's been your experience in the Lutheran church, whether you, you notice that certain churches tend to do better at youth group because they are more traditional. And are there lessons for the, for the non-traditional churches? Even at I university, I, I know that conservative groups, uh, Christian groups tend to be a lot more popular. And, ah, and yeah, so, okay. yeah. Are you, I guess you're talking theologically conservative, right? So, yes. Yeah, yeah look, I, I, in, in the Lutheran Church in Queensland, I think our, our situation is probably a bit different. So if I were to think of where the larger youth groups were, they are typically in churches that are closely linked with a, with one of our schools. Um, and so they have an active uh, mission field into that school. Um, theologically, they probably vary uh, in their, along the spectrum, but I would probably lean to being more progressive. Um, yeah, and that's relative within our, within our context, right? So progressive within, within the Lutheran Church in Queensland. Um, uh, is a very different thing to what it might be in the Anglican Uniting or, or whatnot. So, um, yeah, for us, I, I don't think it's so much, I've never linked it to theology. I've actually linked it more to um, a prioritisation of young people. Um, in the university setting, and I, I think in that young adult sphere, um, so I do think young adults, as they are growing in faith, are drawn to um, churches that um, clearly uh, articulate their faith. And I think in a lot of conservative traditions, um, because they are tend to be, you know, people would call them, say, more black and white in how they read the Bible and how they, um, in, um, their understanding of the Christian faith. I think because they can articulate what they, what they believe more clearly, they aren't, they don't live in the grey as much. That that appeals to young people because they can. Um, uh, they're looking for clear guidance on how to live out this faith that they have or this faith that they're learning about. Um, and I, uh, I think, um, I think that might be why, at the university setting, you, you see that. Um, yeah. I heard from a, a Mormon uh, bishop who was saying that he thinks that the reason that they are more successful at getting young people, at least in his, his part of town, was because they give young people real responsibility. It isn't just a welcome sit in the back. It's they lead prayers, they do homilies, they organise events. Do you kind of agree with that? And do you think there's actually a space within the Lutheran church? Because I think, you know, in the Anglican church, if you wanted to do a sermon, for example, you need the archbishop's permission. If the priest is not the one to do it, you would need to get permission for someone else to do it. So I'm thinking, yeah, well, they wouldn't be getting a 15 year old to do it. Whereas in say the Mormon faith, there are kids giving homilies. Do you, yeah, so do you kind of agree? And if you do agree, do you think there actually is a space to get them more involved in those higher responsibility roles? Yeah, look, I, I think that's one of the things I love about youth ministry and working with young people, right? Is, um, is that you do get to give uh, um, both young adults uh, and younger people the opportunity to have a go at something. So I'm, I'm a firm believer that, um, that responsibility um, uh, should move forward with um, and align with faith maturity, right? So um, I do think that young people should have the opportunity to use their gifts in service. Um, and I think they do move into churches and, and look for spaces where they will do that. Um, in our context, we we give young people a chance to do that on our camps, um, uh, and they get to, you know, they get to lead um, ministries with you know, maybe a hundred young people on a camp and, and other leaders, right? So something that maybe their church might not give them the opportunity to do. Um, the um, the growing young book, you know, the, I don't know if you're familiar with that the resource out of Fuller, but um, they talk about. Um, kind of the giving of keys. Um, so uh, both empowering young people into using their gifts, um, not so much just throwing them in the deep end, 
but giving them a pathway to, to grow and develop and then giving them real responsibility. So it's not just tokenistic involvement. Um, when, when we look back on, you know, David, when you look back on your faith journey, at, at some point, someone gave you the opportunity to, um, to explore your gifts um, in whatever setting that was for you, right? That was certainly true for me. I had people that moved out of particular roles so that I could step into it and, and take those opportunities. Um, and they were key steps in, in being able to use my gifts and so then growing in my faith. Um, so, yeah, look, there are certain parts, you know, in our context too, the Lutheran Church, where um, particular responsibilities maybe are, are held by the pastorate or um, ordained roles. Um, but I think there are plenty of opportunities and we should be exploring them and actively encouraging young people into them to develop those things. So whether that's preaching, um, whether that's leading others, um, whether that's prayer ministry, um, wherever those gifts are, you know, it could be a, a ministry of service. Um, yeah, there are, there are plenty of opportunities and, and I absolutely think that, that young people should be welcomed and, and mentored into those spaces. Do you think young people in their kind of faith is taken seriously? The, the reason I ask that is uh, we heard from a, a young person who leads a Christian organisation and, and they were saying that there's always this, oh, you're too young to be doing this. So do you think so in, in the sort of Christian space that young people, that just their faith isn't taken seriously? Oh, that's nice. You're, you know, you're 15, yes, you believe in Jesus, but it's not given the same way to say a 30-year-old or a 50-year-old sharing their, their faith story. Yeah, look, I think generally, yes. And I think actually, if you look at the churches that are probably growing, they are the ones that are probably um, empowering and giving opportunity to the young people. So they're recognising the, the gifts that the young people already have um, and giving them the opportunity to, to uh, live it out. Um, I often read articles about young entrepreneurs in the secular world, right, who are, who are, kicking goals and building these amazing businesses, but they're young, right? And I, I wonder what it might look like for our church to create a space where the young people in our church could be those young entrepreneurs. They could, you know, lead our church forward. Um, I, don't, I don't think you've got to be 50 or 30 or, you know, even 25. To, um, to have a key role in our church, you know, let alone 60 or 70, right? So, um, yeah, I, I think it, we do need to recognise the capabilities and just understand that, particularly because young people, you know, young adults in their professional spaces might actually be highly respected in whatever field they are. You know, they could be counsellors and um, psychologists. They could be medical professionals. Um, uh, they could be building massive buildings as engineers, Um and yet we're telling them, no, you're not old enough to be on church council or um, no, you, you need to um, be more experienced before you can preach at church or read the Bible. Yeah. So uh, there is a disconnect there. And I think the church does need to, to welcome and, and use the gifts of, of who's in our church. And can I ask you about sort of RE, religious education in schools, what your kind of opinion is on that? Like I've met people who are religious who don't like it. They say, I want to be the one to teach my kid religion, not, not a school. Other people criticise it. Uh, other people say to me, in Christians, say, oh, look, it's a very base level Christianity. I don't think it's actually that good. What's your sort of view on, on RE? Look, do you, do you know, I, I don't play in that space very much. So my, my perspective is, is quite removed. I, you know, I experienced RI growing up myself in, in my local state school that I went to. And um, I have had, you know, my wife used to teach RI and my brother used to teach it. Look, I, I think it's an, an amazing opportunity, actually. Um, any, any time that we can step into a space and share who Jesus is with young people, I think if we're not taking that up, that's a missed opportunity. Um, whatever setting that is. So, you know, I, I think RI is a tremendous gift. And um, in the ideal world, every church would be maximising that opportunity, I think. And what about at the university level? You mentioned that you've had some experience sort of at university chaplains or with university chaplains. Now, a lot mm -hmm. of them, you know, say, oh, how do we engage with students? It's hard. How do we, you know, how do we get people coming to our chapel? 
what's your sort of take on university level chaplaincy? Yeah, look, I, I think it is a difficult space, you know, because um, university campus life has changed over the years too, right? So there was a time when everybody would go to campus for for face to face lectures and tutorials and. Um, there was a, a more of a physical presence on campus and that's with online learning that's that's changed dramatically um, and then you, you're obviously operating in a multi-faith space so that adds complexity too um, yeah there's, there's kind of currently on campus there would be two approaches right so you've got the student movements um, that offer uh, a more evangelical approach to um to campus life and chaplaincy and, um, and the sharing of faith. And then you've got um, chaplains who are typically employed by the universities themselves to offer pastoral care to, to students and staff. Um, I, think, I think both are valid and, and important in what they offer. So I think if you're employed by the university to offer pastoral care, um, the challenges are you're operating in that multi-faith space. Um, and so that I think there are some limitations to what's possible, but I think what, what you can do is, is real and meaningful. Um, and I think, you know, um, the movements that are on campus at the moment, whether they be um, ecumenical or um, I think the Catholic, uh, in Queensland, the Catholic um, Church has some presence on campus too. And, um, you know, I think as external groups on campus, they have much more scope, um, both in terms of evangelising and sharing the faith and discipling young people in a, in a real and incredible way. And uh, I think that's an important, an important opportunity. And I, I would love for the Lutheran Church to have a greater um, presence in that space because I, um, I think that is a formative time for young adults when they're at university. Um, I remember talking to uh, a priest in the Sydney, Sydney Anglicans you know, five, six years ago, and... Um, they suggested that part of, you know, the strength of the Sydney Anglican system at that time was um, could be linked to the purposeful engagement of young adults at university, uh, discipling them um, and supporting them as they were learning in their professional life, um, but then also encouraging and calling them into a life of ministry. You know, so they, they could point to a couple of key um, members of their church who had focused in that space and that that had directly led to um, a growth in the pastorate in, in their movement. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I think, I think university space is pretty key. Um, and I, yeah, I think it's a worthwhile space to play in. We can't compete with the Pokemon club. I'm sorry, Aaron, they seem to have huge numbers, at least at the university I'm at. Do they? they have huge numbers. Harry Potter has huge numbers. I was at a multi-faith uh, chaplaincy tent um, and yes. we were trying to get people to come to us and uh, we were losing to the toga party. There was a guy walking around in a toga saying, come to the toga party. And I couldn't help but notice that seemed to appeal to more people than uh, multi-faith uh, offerings. I'm, I'm surprised that you didn't join the toga party. Dave. I didn't say I didn't. <laughs> yeah, look at... I think the the challenge at the moment in terms of sharing faith is I, th I think people are people want a relational connection, right? So they they want to they want to feel accepted, they want to feel a sense of belonging, uh, and once they've got that, then I think they're open to to hearing what we have to say about who Jesus is. But until we've proven ourselves to be trustworthy and um, uh, transparent and accountable, like real people there um, who care about them as they are then I'm, yeah, until we've done that, I'm, I'm not sure they're as interested in, in what we might have to say about Jesus. So we kind of need to live it first, I think. And with youth groups or young adult groups, what's your definition of success sort of in the Lutheran space? Is it the number of youth groups? Is it the number of people going, how engaged they are? You know, I've, I've debated this probably with lots of people over the years. Um, Look, the, the reality is I think numbers are, are a real measure. Um, it's hard to have any other measure, actually, because um, how do you measure the growth of faith? Um, I, think, I think numbers can sometimes um, be quite superficial, though. So you can have, you know, you can have 100 young people come to a, 
to a massive party that you run. Um, have they have they heard anything about Jesus? Have they grown in their faith at all? Um, does it lead anywhere? I, so I, I think they're real questions to answer. Um, so I, I think, yep, yeah, numbers I think are, are worth looking at, but I, I would also then look at, you know, the, the outcome. So when they... When they're kind of graduating out of youth group, or even as they go through it, what's the what's the fruit that you're seeing? What's the faith that that's been developed? Um, and I, I think you really need to see that that is a meaningful outcome, because um, that's ultimately why we're doing youth group, right? Um, doesn't matter if you've got a hundred people at a pool party. Um, we're more interested in the in the ten that publicly declare their faith and are, and are willing to do that, right? I don't even know a hundred people. I, there was a guy the other day telling me he's getting ready for his traditional Christmas party where he has 40 people over at his home. I thought, geez, I don't even know 40. Uh, oh, really? Wow, Davis. You gotta I get know, out more. I know, I know. The can I ask you in sort of the youth and young adult space, what are the kind of current popular ideas? So, you know, there was the generations together. I know there's messy church. What are the kind of um, popular things now in, in the space? Yeah, look at look in our space. Our focus at the moment is that growing young resource from from Fuller. Um, so it really does. Um, so it, it's built on research of uh, effectively what they did is they looked at what are what are healthy or uh, churches where young people uh, are thriving and, and are welcomed. Um, they looked at what what that was across various um, uh, church traditions, and they identified a number of factors that all of these churches were displaying. Um, and I, I think we found that to be a really good synthesis of, um, you know, a continuation of research that, that, that existed prior that shows what a, a church can do to, to care about young people and to welcome them into your community. So that's, that's probably a key resource for, for us um, that, we're, that we're working through. And can I ask you, what do you think youth groups can do for young people so you know there's often this thing well if christianity is so good why why isn't every christian a, a good upstanding you know citizen can, what can youth groups do can they make us better citizens um, or do you think look there's only so much you can do in a one hour or two hour youth group a week but how much good can we do at a youth group or young adults level yeah, look, I, I think we need to remember that we it's not all on us right so the, the holy spirit is 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 doing some work here. Um, and actually it, it is God who builds his church. Um, so there are there is good work for us to do. Um, and there are it's it's good that we are good stewards and that we are acting um, uh, well and, and making good decisions. But um, God is God is a part of what we're doing, right? So um, we're working in partnership with what he's doing. Um, so yeah, look at what so your, your question was, uh, what what realistically can, can youth groups do to grow good yes. people? Is good that people, kind yeah, of where you ended yeah, up? Yeah, now some people might say, well, there's only so much they can do. Or, or, or do you think, well, actually, things like scouts or youth groups can actually make people, um, you know, good citizens, good, good Christians, or is it just sort of it's beyond our ability to do that? And I know at the sort of the adult level, people will say, well, you know, being an ethicist at university doesn't actually make you that good of a person in real life necessarily. I'm just wondering if you think youth groups can actually make people better. People. You know, I'm, I'm less less concerned, and I'm maybe I'm speaking out of school here, but I'm less concerned about youth groups making good people um, and probably more about them uh, planting seeds and growing faith. Um, I think I, I'm quite happy for for the Holy Spirit to convict people um, in who they are, and, and um, um, yeah, I, I think the focus for me of youth group is not so much good people, but um, growing faith. So, um, and obviously those things will overlap a little bit as we um, are sanctified and as we grow closer to be like who Jesus is. Um, but that's a journey, right? Um, and some of us will get there fast and some of us will get there very slowly. Um, but I think what we want is to, to help young people start that journey with Jesus. Um, 
and whether they're running it quickly or slowly as a marathon, um, if they are doing it with Jesus, then then I think that's the that's the win, right? That's we'll let we'll let the Holy Spirit do its work and conform um, you know young people into His image. So, yeah. And what's the relevance for young people? If, so if a young person comes up to you and says, why would I join any group in a church? You know, I've got fellowship at the supermarket or, you know, the shopping centre. I, I, why do I need, why do I need this? I, you know, I live quite well without it. Or I have Christian friends who seem to be having a lot of mess in their life. So it doesn't seem to really make any difference. Why is it relevant to me? Yeah, look, I, I think the answer for, for young people is the same as it is for adults, right? So, you know, the, the difference is is Jesus. Um, so, yes, all of our lives are, are messed up, um, even, even Christians, right? Not everything goes right. We all have similar struggles. Um, bad things happen to us too. Um, and, yes, we, we have community in lots of different spaces in our lives, but um, the gift that the church has is, um, is Jesus, um, you know, we have this, this wonderful gift of grace um, and forgiveness. Um, we have a Heavenly Father who, who loves us as we are um, and, um, you know, works and walks with us through life, through all of that mess, um, through all of that brokenness. Um, and I think that's a, that's a gift that the church has that you can't get in your own. Um, uh, your other fellowships, whether that be at work or a, you know, a soccer club, um, those are valid spaces where you, for human connection. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing is is like that gift of Jesus that the church has to um, to share with others. And can I ask you about a Lutheran service? So for someone who's say they've never been to a Lutheran service, what is unique about a Lutheran service compared to say a Catholic or an Anglican or, or Baptist. Yeah, great question. So, look, I think it depends on your on your context. I went to a an Anglican funeral of um, uh, an uncle of mine. This was probably five six years ago now, and the order of service was actually the same order of service I grew up with in the Lutheran Church, um, which I found fascinating. Like, I, yeah, it took me back to my childhood. It was great. Um, so. The Lutheran Church, there is a there's a spectrum of, of worship practice. Where there are um, we are by definition um, uh, more traditional than than say uh, you might find in a Pentecostal or even a Baptist worship service. So we um, we are sacramental. So a Lutheran Church service will will always begin with an invocation. Um, we'll always have um, the confessing and of sins and um, absolution. Uh, we'll always have um, uh, communion, uh, well, typically. Uh, so at my church, I think we are we are abstaining from communion for, for Advent this year, but typically we will enjoy communion every every week, right? And for us, um, when we when we take communion, we are um, taking the real presence of of Jesus. Um, so, we, in terms of our theological understanding, we are we are close to probably Anglican and, and Catholic. Um, in, in a lot of a lot of ways and probably in terms of worship practice probably similar um, how that's expressed in each church is a little bit different so um, if you go to some Lutheran churches it will be quite a formal process of, of working through the liturgy um, in others it, it might be a bit more relaxed but the liturgy will be will be informing and kind of guiding what, what's happening um, some of our, our youth services might look more Pentecostal or um, or Baptist style, you know, a bank of songs and a sermon, and um, but even in those settings, we will typically always still enjoy um, and partake in communion. Um, so, yeah, that's that's probably a key sacrament for us. Yeah. And for those that are, that may watch this, if they're sitting there going, "Why doesn't David ask Aaron this question or that question?" You can still ask us. Um, those questions, just send them to the Australian Student Christian Movement and we'll hound Aaron um, with, with the questions. Because I know there's people watching going, we'll watch and go, oh, there's a really burning question that I want to ask, but uh, oh, David hasn't asked it. So if they do have a question, please send it on to me and then I'll forward it on to Aaron. Aaron, that's for, the, that's for a final question. The, the yeah. future of sort of youth and young adults in the Lutheran church or more broadly. Now, no one obviously knows the future, but what is your kind of view 
about the future of the church, the future of, of especially young people within the church. Are you optimistic? Are you are you pessimistic? Yeah, it's look, it's a it's a great question, David. I my my typical position is I I am optimistic. I like to think that um, the best is yet to come, and that we haven't seen the the best of what's what's to come. So. But uh, look, I, I am realistic about probably the state of our church. So I, I think our our church, well, along with a lot of churches, you know, this is post COVID, right? So um, COVID's impacted uh, most denominations, um, and I think probably um, resulted in in members who were were maybe more regular becoming less regular. So, um, and I think that's true for young people as it is for adults, right? So. And really, for me, where that fell over was was in relationship and community. So COVID really separated us, um, and it's taking some time to build that community back. Um, I I think our, the future of our church um, will hinge on how well we can engage young people, um, how well we can involve them in faith and in life. Um, you know, whether we need to, as a church, um, whether we continue to decline for a while, um, that, that may well occur. But I, I think it is the, the future is both in our young people um, uh, to, to lead us forward. And I, I think it's also a responsibility for us older people to, um, uh, to invest in that space. Uh, I think if we're not focused in that area, if that's not a priority of who we are, then I think they're the churches that aren't going to make it. Um, the churches that are going to carry um, the Lutheran Church in Queensland forward uh, and probably the Anglican Church forward and any other church are the ones that really focus in that young space. Um, and, you know, David, I, I don't know how often you work with young people, but um, I, I am always amazed at how incredible they are. So um, they are more than capable. Um, and I don't think, you know, we don't need to wait until, they, until they're old <laughs> to involve them and to lead our church. We can do that now. And um, I think that's a critical step for us to, to really kick forward and, and, and kickstart growth in our movements again. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, uh, for joining. I really do appreciate it. You didn't have to and you did. So thank you so much. That's all right. Pleasure. Happy to help out.